There is something wrong with Greensdale Volunteer Fire Station. I've always wanted to be a firefighter. My grandfather was a captain in Philadelphia and would always tell me stories about his adventures. Like riding the stick up high-rise buildings to save a baby dangling from a fire escape. Okay, so they were a little exaggerated. When I was 10, my family moved up north to Greensdale, Pennsylvania, and I didn't really talk with my grandfather much after that. I live a block away from the Greensdale Volunteer Fire Department, and I always wanted to meet the firefighters there, but I was too shy to approach them. I was 14 when I learned about the Junior Firefighter Program and wasted no time joining. The first month was covered in a thin veil of wonderment and excitement. I felt like I was really a part of the team, and the firefighters were friendly and welcomed me in with open arms. It didn't take long before the cracks started to show, however. I could tell you about the time I was on call with a man who died in 1933, or about the hundreds of times we get ambulance calls from elderly women talking about the picket man in their yard. I haven't had the pleasure of going out on these calls, though. So, I'll tell you about Ryan. Ryan was another junior. I didn't talk with him much, mostly due to a mild speech impediment and a southern accent that stuck out this far north, but he didn't seem like a bad kid. I'd been working with the company for about a year at this point, and he asked me to teach him about the stuff on the apparatus. Cool, I can do that. It was refreshing to see someone actually interested in the fire service as our other two juniors were only here for community service and would often shirk their duties, straight up leave on calls and steal equipment. All these problems and more are my problems since I was chief of juniors. A fake title and position given to me because our lieutenant couldn't be bothered to babysit the juniors. I went over the equipment on our truck and when I started to move to the engine, he stopped me and asked, Wait, what's in compartment D4? I stopped and looked back at him with a blank face and replied, You don't need to worry about that. You see, our truck isn't supposed to have a compartment D4, but from time to time, somebody mentions a rectangular compartment labeled D4. We don't ever open it, mostly because we can't. We've tried everything to force it open, whenever it shows up, but it never does which speaks leagues about us because forcible entry is supposed to be our bread and butter. He kept asking about it, and I finally replied, Yes, we have a compartment D4, but we shouldn't. That shut him up. Occasionally from the off-duty room, or game room as we call it, you will hear an old call box ring. Most firefighters reading this will know what that sounds like, but to those who don't, it's pretty much just a bell rapidly being rung. Ryan asked where the call box was, and I pointed to a part of the wall where there was a rectangular area with no paint, in the shape of a call box. It was right there. We haven't used a call box for years. The department sold it at auction in 2001 because we really had no use for it, and it would go off for no reason despite having no power connected to it. Apparently, though, it wasn't done with us yet. Ryan stopped asking questions altogether at that point. You learn to accept the weird shit that goes down here. One last story. This happened last night, and I can say it's the first time it has happened. I am currently studying to take my Firefighter 1 class when I am 18, and as most firefighters know, those can be stressful. I crashed at the station despite the curfew and stated for juniors, but nobody really enforces it except the chief. I awoke to see a silhouette outside the window of the door. I rose quickly to try to identify who they were. When my vision began to focus, he vanished. Okay, kind of weird. I got up and left the room quietly as to not awaken the live-ins who desperately needed their sleep. I faintly saw a figure cross a corner leading to a turnout gear storage closet. We aptly dubbed it the graveyard. I had been in there a few times, but I was always with a senior member. They don't like juniors being on their own because of some recent thefts. I entered the room and immediately I almost tripped. In front of me was a stairwell. A fucking stairwell. Our bunk room was on the second floor 
and this should have led into the social hall. I sighed and descended the stairs, accepting my situation. The floor was sticky. When I got down, I thought I could hear the faint sound of keys jingling mixed with footsteps in the distance. The room was dimly lit, though I couldn't find the source of the light. I saw wire shelves stocked with random stuff like plates, light bulbs, toy trucks, folding chairs, and soap. There was no pattern to these items. As I was looking at all of these, I didn't notice a nail on the floor. I stepped on it and screamed in pain. I heard the keys shift suddenly. Whoever was down here with me just turned towards me. The dim light went out and I could hear the shelves and their contents spilling onto the floor. I turned to where I thought I came from and hit a wall. Somehow, the thing was still in pursuit of me, like it could see me. I heard a deep, distorted voice say behind me, What's in compartment D4, Matthew? It was not said like a question, but like a regular statement. Laughter erupted around me, high-pitched grainy laughter, like it was being played on an old recording. I spun around to see a man of average build, likely six and a half feet, towering over my five foot nine stature. His face looked like a marshmallow left in the fire for too long. I passed out and landed on the cold, sticky floor. I awoke in my bunk in a cold sweat. Thank fuck it was just a dream, I thought as I looked towards the door. But in the window, I know I saw that face again. I assumed it was a hallucination until I put my hand on the back of my head and I felt my sticky hair. And I noticed my foot was bleeding all over the sheets.